to call back in the session the Lane County Board of Commissioners regular meeting for Tuesday, September 22nd, 2015. And getting back into our agenda, we left a couple items off this morning that we ran into lunch a little bit. I'd like to start out with county administration announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, a couple things I want to update you on, and then I've asked Lizzie Cunningham to be here uh, to just give a quick update on uh, the launch of our Race Around the World uh, initiative that started today. But first, I want to uh, make a comment about uh, some public comments and board discussion this morning uh, related to particularly youth homelessness in the 15th night initiative, and I forwarded the board an email correspondence between uh, myself and the city manager, uh, Eugene, uh, related to the 15th night initiative and shared uh, with all of you that um, we have met. Uh, there is an initiative that is going on. There are a number of entities that are participating in that effort. There's a catalytic team that's been uh, created and uh, I've asked that we should go to their director of health and human services to serve on that catalytic team. Uh, I don't think there's a better person to represent Wayne County than Alicia on that effort. Um, I know that Grace Fugu is actively involved in that effort as the city and a number of private and nonprofit organizations. Uh, that group is going to be working on direction, oversight, strategy, mission, priorities, and resource requirements, um, and then the implementation of the first year's business plan. So I just want to make a note that as you talk this morning about uh, youth homelessness and the 15th night initiative in particular, that Wayne County is at the table and we're actively involved in that effort and we look forward to progress uh, on that front. Uh, as well as others. Um, and then I wanted to also share with you that uh, you put on your calendars and for any employees who are watching, on October 15th, from 8.15 to noon, we have our uh, equity summit. We do two equity summits every year, and uh, we've invited back a University of Oregon law professor, Eric Irvin, I believe it's how it's pronounced. I know that Health and Human Services, in particular youth services, has worked with Mr. Irvin related to the issue. He's a, uh, viewed as an expert um, on implicit bias, and we had him at our last, uh, would have been our spring equity summit to talk about implicit bias, and the best turnout that we've had in a long time for equity summit, so we've invited him back to facilitate some roundtables around um, implicit bias and uh, look forward to county employees and, uh, and our partners participating in that, and that's a trillion health. Um, okay, and then I'd like to invite those of you from Human Resources for just a quick update. And I think that this, uh, the timing of this, I think works really well. But before we talk about our community health improvement plan, we can first talk about our employee health improvement uh, plan and some initiatives around that. Specifically, we'll just uh, briefly this morning talk about the Race Around the World initiative that was launched today. It's an eight-week effort to really promote health and wellness among our employees. Uh, we have a lot of participation that we're excited about, and it follows the board's earlier actions today uh, and a number of initiatives that the board has supported and our, our HR staff and county administration and departments throughout Lane County have been actively involved and supportive of not just providing health insurance for employees, but making sure that we have health care and uh, proactive ownership of our own wellness. So with that, I'll just ask the board to go and share some comments about the resource that we're on Thank you, Steve, and Mr. Chair, and Mr. Chair, thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, Steve said I am Lindsay Kennedy, and I work in the Benefits and Benefits and Benefits Specialist in HR. Um, Race Around the World is an eight-week physical activity challenge um, where employees can enroll to compete to walk, bike, and swim, run the most. Um, so this program is web-based. out all 200 of those visits to our employees and the risk 
response that I got from many of them was overwhelming. Um, I had one employee, she said to me, um, she wanted to verify that she got to keep the fit, but she thought that she would have to give it back. Um, I had a gentleman tell me that the reason he's been getting up every day to work out is because he wants to go into the website later, log his activity, and stay at the top of that leaderboard um, because he knows that his colleagues are seeing that. So the employees are very appreciative of your commitment to their well-being. They recognize that that's a priority for the board, and they really, really are. I think they're very encouraged by that. Um, the other part is it's fun and it's competitive. Um, the employees get to compete with people, um, whether or not they're in their building, and they receive recognition for their efforts. Um, so we're also administering a pre and a post survey um, to the employees to ask them, um, are you physically active now? What are your um, what are your wellness goals now? Um, how do you feel about your overall well-being right now? And then we'll administer that survey again at the end of the challenge so we can collect some data on the effectiveness of um, allowing employees and engaging with employees to be more physically active. Last thing that I want to submit to you this morning is that Pacific Source has offered to give us five additional um, Fitbits to hand out. I mentioned that we have the initial 200 that were given to the employees, but we do have um, five more. And I did the math. There are five commissioners up here. Um, so if you haven't signed up already, um, we would really, really love that top level support. We know that that's critical for um, our county to really make some big strides in this area of wellness. If you already have a Fitbit, then we'll give it to someone else. Um, but again, thank you for your time. And let's have some fun. I would just add, um, here's my guide. Um, I will add that I was at the uh, Health and Human Services Management team meeting on Friday, and they are qu a quite competitive group. Uh, and, you know, they're, they sort of keep statistics on how each division is doing in different areas. Evaluations was one of them, and I know that they're going to be keeping statistics on the participation and, and uh, having healthy competition in that department, and that's what we've been trying to foster throughout the organization. So it's a great effort, and uh, we thank our employees for participating in that, and we'll certainly report back to the board on progress. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. I, I will say I did sign up for the race around the world challenge. I've got, got my Fitbit, so we'll see how I do. I'm really shocked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, any other questions on that? I don't think one of the buttons is all stuck up. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
on the fifth inch. So. <laughs> it's a throwdown. <laughs> I wrote 10,000 steps yesterday, by the way. Okay. I'm going to find someone else or fight with my dog and let him run. Wow. That's impressive. Okay. So uh, today we're going to, we are going to go over the trip. We have a presentation for you. So we have plenty of time for conversation. Uh, the current chip was adopted three years uh, was adopted for a three year period and with work now underway for the new community health needs assessment and improvement plan uh, that will be ready for review and adoption in the summer of 2016. There's just under a year left on the current plan, and this is an opportunity, as Steve mentioned, for the board to assess progress to date and determine direction for the remaining year uh, of work. So here are a number of our goals, uh, again, reiterating what Steve talked about for a discussion today. We're going to give you a status report on our current chip. We're going to discuss potential strategies from the chip and uh, what Lane County might want to uh, prioritize that isn't currently a prioritized. And we also want to provide you that update on trillium that you asked for at your last meeting. Our plan is uh, to take these uh, goals in order, these in order today, and have an opportunity, like I said, to pause the questions and discussion between each section. So I hope that will work for the board. I also um, want to introduce or uh, have staff introduce themselves. We have a number of them here with us in the room today. They truly are experts, our leads, and at times are visionaries for each of the items, uh, uh, each of the tip strategies. So I'm going to ask them just to introduce yourself and your position in the uh, organization. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm Carla Ayers, Division Manager for Lane County Behavioral Health. Anthony Center, Program Supervisor, Community Kelly Sullivan, Group Program Supervisor, Public Health. Kathleen C.A. Baskerville, Public Health Prevention Program Supervisor. And Karen Gaffney, Assistant Director. I'm going to turn it over to Karen uh, for the background timelines and much more. I get to do the history, so we'll start with that and do some slides. Um, I know that most of us remember this process, having lived through it. Uh, however, the county administrator wasn't with us when we launched this plan, so I hope you'll indulge me just a couple minutes to kind of go back in history and talk about how we got to where we are right now on the chip, and I think that also provides some good context for any members of the public who might be tuning in and uh, catching this conversation for the first time. The four logos that are on this slide, uh, Lane County, Peace Health, Trillium, and United Way work together to complete our first collaborative community health improvement plan um, that culminated in summer of 2013. And the governing bodies of each of those organizations uh, reviewed the documents and adopted them uh, with Lane County Board of Health doing that adoption in June of 2013. Uh, it was designed then as a three-year plan and identified five specific priorities uh, for health in, in our community that we would all work together to address as a community to improve health status. Uh, the plan tackled huge issues across many different domains and really set a significant work plan into play in our community. Um, taking on this plan was not for the faint of heart. It really is a big lift in many parts of our community to move the needle in these areas. So the slide lists those five uh, major priority areas in the community chip. Um, and I'm going to try and be clear because later on in the story we select five priorities here. But these are the priorities in the community's uh, collaborative community health improvement plan. And I'm actually going to go through each of those five areas and review what the strategies are in that larger chip. Um, since one of our goals today was to um, in the end circle back around and find out if there are any of these items that you didn't pick in 2013 that you think you really do want to add to the list. And I know there are a couple items that have come up during uh, past board of health meetings, so we'll circle back around. So I'm going to go quickly through each of these. The first priority was to advance health equity, 
And sometimes we get questions about what we mean by health disparities or health equity. So I want to start there. Healthy People 2020 defined health disparities as a particular type of health difference that's closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. So those are the disparities we're trying to correct. Health disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on their racial or ethnic group, religion, socioeconomic status, gender, age, mental health, cognitive or sensory or physical disability, sexual orientation or gender identity, geographic location, or other characteristics historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. So I wanted to get that right from Healthy People 2020. So that's uh, really the definition that we as a community used when identifying um, health equity as a priority. The strategies in this area include first using a health equity lens to look at all the other four CHIP priorities. So we'll see some of that as we go through the other priorities. Um, and then also increasing the understanding of health disparities among leaders in the community. And then engaging diverse communities in health policy work and CHIP activities. Strategy number five is specifically targeted at uh, recruiting more diverse healthcare workforce. And number six focuses on improving cultural competency within that same workforce. Finally, there are strategies to set goals for reducing disparities, collecting data to monitor progress, and then disseminating lessons learned. So that's priority one in the chip. The second one is to prevent and reduce tobacco use, and we've talked a lot about this one here at the Board of Health. Um, tobacco, as we've said, remains the leading cause of preventable death in our community and our country, and really takes a high toll both in terms of healthcare costs and productivity. Our chip identifies seven strategies uh, to address this area. Again, first starting with a strategy to increase awareness about the issue among community leaders. And then other strategies include working to increase the price of tobacco through an increased tobacco tax, and then directing that revenue to prevention and treatment. The next two strategies are focused at increasing the number of smoke free spaces, uh, with number three focused on city and county campuses, parks and educational facilities, healthcare sites, and other work sites. Number four specifically targets multi family housing sites. Strategies five and six talk about promoting the state tobacco quit line and using communication strategies to change behavior. And then finally, number seven identifies a goal of strengthening Eugene's tobacco retail licensing program to include the inspections and enforcement. Next, uh, prevent and reduce obesity. This uh, third area actually included the largest number of strategies in the plan, and it starts like the others did with increasing awareness among community leaders. Strategies two and three are designed to encourage local organizations, both public and private, to adopt policies that encourage healthy behavior, and that includes uh, providing healthy foods at meetings and uh, stocking vending machines and other vendors with healthy foods. The next two strategies were designed to build community readiness for policies that would raise the price of sugar-sweetened beverages as a strategy to reduce consumption and building support for a strong community mandate in schools. Again, I, the CHIP didn't say we're going to adopt those policies, but it's really focused on building readiness. Strategy six is to support statewide efforts to secure funds for active transportation, and that includes public transit, inner city rail, bicycle, and pedestrian projects. Strategy seven is to support efforts by employers and schools to promote physical activity. We've been some about that uh, right before this item started. And our current race around the world uh, for county employee wellness would be one example of that. Strategy eight is to support efforts to fund farm to school, farm to institution, and other similar efforts that connect local healthy foods to schools and other people who might not easily have access to those. And number nine is designed to explore the feasibility of healthy food zones near schools. And then finally, strategy 10 is to use communication and media strategies, again, to target behavior change. Substance abuse and mental health. Uh, in this area, a number of broad efforts were identified. The first is to increase public, educator, and healthcare provider awareness of key prevention factors related to substance abuse and mental health, and those include risk of protective factors, mental health promotion strategies, adverse childhood experiences, and the power of positive social norms. 
The tip also identifies the importance of helping work sites adopt mental health friendly policies. Um, we certainly have some of those here at Lane County, like our EAP, and of developing policies that reduce access to lethal means of self self harm firearms, poisons, prescription medicines, alcohol, and other drugs. Strategy four calls out the importance of policies that reduce retail and social availability of alcohol and other drugs. And number five identifies the importance of healthcare and social service organizations adopting evidence-based and uh, trauma-informed screening assessment for the trial process. Okay, and one more, access to care. Uh, the final priority includes a number of items, again, that we've discussed as the Board of Health in past meetings. The first is to increase the number of people with health insurance, and we've done a bang up job of that in Oregon. Uh, and the second is to actually get people access to care through a primary care medical home. Strategy three is to increase access to disease self-management programs, and there are a number of excellent evidence-based examples of those. Number four is to increase immunization rates, uh, and the next one is to improve access to health care in our rural communities. Strategy six targets the challenges we've had in many populations and communities in providing access to dental care. And number seven is focused on the integration of primary care and behavioral health. The last strategy on this list is to expand the healthcare workforce. And I know we've talked here in the past about um, providers in particular, physicians, nurse practitioners, um, physician assistants, but this also includes nurses and all the other members of the medical team. So, I know that was rapid, but that's the overview of the content of our current chip. Uh, so, next I want to talk about how Lane County approached selecting what we would work on during that three year period. So in October of 2013, um, in October of 2013, uh, the board held a work session. So in June, you adopted the chip for the community, and then in October, held a work session to review the strategies that I just went through, and um, and went through a really pretty thorough process to identify three to five areas that you felt were priorities for work by county staff, um, and really for yourself as a board. Um, prior to that meeting, you might recall Dr. Lucky and I met with each one of you individually to review what was in the chip, answer questions, assess those areas of interest, and then you spent a couple hours as a group sorting through a list of possible strategies for the county and ultimately identified six areas of specific interest. Uh, after that October discussion, Health and Human Services took that work back to our existing staff, identified a staff champion for each of those areas, um, and those folks are here with us today, and then they developed the beginning of a work plan for each of those strategies, and we brought those back to you at the Board of Health meeting in November of 2013. And then those became really the foundational elements for most of our Board of Health reports and meetings with you since that time. And then um, a year later, in October of 2014, when you adopted the strategic plan for the county, you incorporated the specific health priorities from the CHIP as part of your goal around healthy and safe communities. So that is our background and history piece. Um, these are the specific priorities in no specific order um, that you came up with through that process. Uh, the first is to adopt an ordinance to license tobacco retail outlets. The second was to look at promoting farm to school and other efforts from the obesity section. Uh, the third was to improve community understanding of adverse childhood experiences, those ACEs, uh, and really champion community efforts to reduce those ACEs in Lane County. The fourth was to expand the availability of targeted evidence-based behavioral health services, such as those for people who are homeless or who are in the correction system. The fifth was to increase access to health services in rural areas. And then those of you who were in the room might remember you had this six little, oh, this will be easy, just do health and health policies too. Um, so we uh, included that sixth uh, priority in our work, and that was actually direct work then that the board and your finance and audit committee did. So that's how we got to the six priorities that the board has. And so I'm going to pause there and um, turn it back to Alicia to give you our progress to date on those. Thank you.
Yes, sir. You're going to get that. So, I had a quick question on obesity. Yes, sir. On the obesity uh, side, and this really relates to children, uh, ch- childhood obesity. So, here of late, and, I, and I'm going to guess it must be coming from the same article, and it came out about August. And I'm now I've seen it probably in about seven or eight different publications. But it's the most simplest thing. It's called Push Your Plate Away. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but it's really interesting. Now, growing up, I don't know about you, but how many times my father used to say, clean your plate because there's a starving child somewhere. (laughs) So this, but if you heard this morning with the OSU extension, I think you heard all of us had some sort of, like we had 4-H, we had something like this. I had a 60-acre pasture to run around on. We had an 800-acre ranch going up a hill. We stayed in shape. Children today do not have that ability. And basically what the article was su- suggesting on child obesity is that you don't have to clean your plate. When you're full, push it away and be done with it. And it's just, it is so simple, but yet that concept they, they believe can uh, really help with the issue of child obesity. You know, and I know we, we, we've probably gone through this, but I'm just throwing that out to you, and, and uh, it, it's, it's pretty interesting. As simplistic as it may sound, there's probably some... It's, it's probably fairly sound, you know. You know, looking at, at what what the uh, information is available, I would just throw that out to you on, on that. I I just I found it fascinating, but uh, but it goes against the entire core of when I was growing up. But I can clearly see. I mean, the reason why it it makes a lot of sense now with our country moving so much from rural to more urban, and children today do not have those same opportunities as we had when we were growing up. And, and so I'm, I'm just, that's the reason I just want to throw that out to you. And it's, like I said, these articles all came out at the same time, late August. No, so I appreciate that, Commissioner. And I think sometimes our solutions don't have to be complicated. They yeah. can be simple and effective solutions. And I believe there are a lot of cultural messages that it makes sense to take another look at. Thank you. Thank you. Are you clicking for any? Would you like me to put it in Thank you. So um, I'm, my job now is to go over six, the six priorities and talk to you about uh, where we are today. So we're about two-thirds of the way through, and we're at what we said we were going to do, and what have we done, and what are we still waiting to do, and starting to launch. So we've chosen to color coordinate, or color code, we didn't coordinate, color code. So green is check, done, finish, did that. Uh, if you see the black print, that is still on the way. We've started it and it's underway. And what you see red, those are still waiting to launch. Those strategies are still waiting to launch. So on the adoption of the uh, ordinance uh, to license tobacco retail outlets, you can see most of that is green. Um, And it should look rather familiar to all of you. It represents a lot of work over the course of many months to adopt and revise the the tobacco retail license. This one, as you can see, is largely complete, complete with the remaining task underway of working with the cities to expand adoption of the, of the strong uh, tobacco retail licensing uh, countywide. Public health staff are actively in discussions with a number of cities and expect work to continue through the rest of the year. So that's why it is black. Support farm to school and other efforts. You see we have some green and some red. This strategy has been a terrific joint effort between public health, economic development, and intergovernmental relations staff. There was some great success last year, including work on the farm to school bill in the legislature. And there is still some work to do. The three strategies listed in red are soon to launch. The efforts with the Alliance of Healthy Families will enhance work on the Healthy Bethel Family Project and outreach efforts for SNAP Match uh, is pending some more definition on how the program uh, will roll out. Uh, and I understand the board has provided some support towards the launch of this effort. Finally, as the work on economic development on the development of local food hubs moves forward, public health will work to support the effort as appropriate.
to improve understanding of ACEs. Uh, there are a number of significant areas of work underway related to this, uh, this area in understanding of ACEs. In November of 2014, the Making Connections Conference, uh, co-sponsored by the county, Trillium, and the Oregon Health Authority had 362 attendees and featured keynote address by the author of the original ACEs study. Staff have presented at a dozen community organizations reaching hundreds of professionals. Uh, this is black text on the slide because the effort will continue through the rest of the year. Last week, you approved using some existing health and human service fund to create a temporary staff person to help make sure we finish strong on this strategy and we continue to produce and distribute educational materials in health and human services and in the community. The final strategy is uh, to launch in this area is engagement of the media in this effort, and that should begin in the fall uh, or soon with uh, addition of a temporary project manager. Awesome. Uh, I know. That's like <laughs> it's coming up. Uh, so on this one, uh, we've talked about this particular strategy a lot recently, including uh, the recent report uh, from the PSTC that Tim Lau and Lisa brought to you last week. We have a number of important strategies underway in this area, as much uh, and, and much of this will sound familiar, uh, particularly since uh, the presentation last week. There are two on the list that have been marked as complete. The award of the 2014 State Mental Health Investment Funds and funding with the support service, uh, support and services. This translated into additional funding for jail diversion and expanded crisis services, as well as expanded supported employment and homeless medical respite services. The others on the list in black are uh, text and are very much underway. The list of collaborative efforts include mental health summit work that resulted in the report you reviewed last week and also including the number of key partnerships that are helping support the expanded system. The third strategy relates to medication support and includes jail diversion project uh, as well as participants in the 2000, in the 370 program and mental health court receiving priority access to prescriber services. Work is underway to explore telemedicine and expand collaborations with primary care, such as the community health center. The need for shelter and housing is a critical ongoing issue, and some strides have been made, uh, such as short-term housing with rural health, and other efforts are underway, such as planning for the 54-unit apartment community with the Hacksaw and sponsors. Cost system coordination is underscored both through the PSCC as well as the work that Children Behavioral Health and Peace Health are doing in rural areas to access need to uh, rural areas to access needs and improve access. Finally, the list includes a uh, move to improve electronic health records at Lane County Behavioral Health, which is scheduled to go live this December. Halfway through. Thanks for that. I'm kind of liven it up. It's all jokes now. Um, this area, expanded health services in rural areas. This is where we still have significant uh, work that's needed. Two of the strategies are not complete. With the additional gap analysis uh, was completed early on identifying service levels in different communities. And we did some exciting work in Oak Ridge, including the board awarding economic development funds to a startup of the new Orchard Orchid Health Clinic in the community. And we're working with our partners at Trillium to provide additional support. The two other strategies are still in process. The first is to work with partners to strengthen access, with one strong focus being the expansion of telemedicine for uh, the rural areas, and finally to focus on addressing the overall lack of primary care providers and is a critical element in moving uh, forward in this area. Lane County is currently participating in an Oregon Solutions Project to increase the number of nurse practitioners and physician assistants in Lane County as part of the United Front, and the county continues to support policies to change to make local residency programs more feasible. Cross-system 
course, I would not do that because that was my last job. See, look, a little excitement. <laughs> this is actually, it's very exciting. When you look at all the work that's been done, and this is done by staff who you know, put this on top of their other work. So I don't know I'm doing it justice with my um, green, red, and black, but we'll try. So uh, the implementation of health and all policies approach uh, to the board. The last priority was implemented in health and all policies approach uh, uh, for the board of commission meetings. And as you can see from the green text, we've made great progress in this area. The APM and cover demo have been revised to include an analog analysis of health impacts for most, most board packets. Additionally, staff in public health developed an in-person and online training for a staff in departments across the county to be able to complete the streamline analysis. The new policy has been implemented and is an initial evaluation was completed by graduate students at U of O as part of the capstone project. The remaining task that has yet not yet started is to look at an ongoing evaluation and refine technical assistance basis on the evaluation. So then, that is a lot in a uh, little bit of time, really, and again with staff and creativity and uh, work on the projects with really no other support um, uh, other than uh, what uh, they could fit in and, and do during their regular business hours with their already full agendas. So that is mine, and we're now going to stop and hear from you and see if you have any questions or um Kind of checking in, are we on the right track still with where we said we were going to go with what we have done with the priorities of the chip? So, is this the point where you want us to either suggest new priority areas or, or you know, whether or not, yeah? So, we have, I'll highlight for you what's coming next, but you need to decide if you want to do it now. Um, so, the next set of slides, we pull to, um, information on two topics that I know have come up in fire discussions um, tobacco free parks and tobacco free campuses. Um, so, we have a couple slides on those, which were other strategies from the chip. Um, but yes, either now or later, if there are some of these that you think we should, we've done enough on and we should stop now, or if there are new strategies, uh, we definitely want to hear those things today. Mr. Sorensen. Um, I had a question about whether there's been any attempt at measuring the uh, outcomes here, whether anything's changed. You, you noticed that, I noticed that you said, well, we did this, we did this, we haven't done this. We're going to do this. I get that, that not everything's done. But is there any way to tell whether um, the accomplishment of something or the attempt to accomplish something has resulted in a positive change? So I'm interested in the measurement component, not not the accomplishment that right. we, we did. It. We, we, we said we wanted, wanted to do this, but is there a measurable impact? So um, I'm just going to touch back on one that I briefly touched on around the health in all policies. You know, we did have the folks from the graduate program come from the capstone project and look at has it been effective, and we're hoping to, I don't know what our plan is to have them back or to, uh, to do that again. Uh, because of timing, they were only able to look at a short period, but that's where they looked at all of your meetings and looked at how often we talked about health and then did the same thing after health in all policies. Uh, was implemented. We also looked at um, the we talking by commissioners was viewed as a positive thing. <laughs> well, the goal was viewed as a positive thing. The goal of the policy. I always thought it was the opposite. No, no, no. No, the goal of that particular strategy was to increase the consideration of health impacts. So it was to test did that policy actually make a difference in terms of your needs? Right. And so we were looking at that. We were looking. At, they were also looking at the packets and the depth that people went into on their packets. So in that case, yes, we have uh, looked at you know having effect, and we will look again. So. Do one other example, and then I guess I would turn it open to our subject matter 
experts in each of those areas too. Um, on, I think about the tobacco retail license, for instance. Um, that is one we haven't gathered data on yet, but we would expect now that that policy is in place, um, our folks in environmental health will begin to do compliance checks, and so we'll be able to have data for you about whether there's compliance with that policy, and then in the next round of um, sign-our checks where we actually get some data about which retailers sell that um, to young people or not, that will be our evaluation tool that will help show does it for that policy contribute to making a difference. But we don't have that data yet. So I'm going to open it up to anybody else who... Certainly for the Behavioral Health Initiative, um, we could provide specific numbers um, on the job diversion program, the number of individuals that um, have been taken out of, of the jail system and engaged into behavioral health treatment at any kind of behavioral health, um, as well as the number of individuals that have access to short-term housing. Um, those are all, all numbers and outcomes that, that we could provide to you. And we could also provide um, numbers for currently analyzing um, integration of primary care and behavioral health. And what we're looking at is um, prior to folks being a part of that program, how much were they accessing the emergency room? How much were they accessing the state hospital and all the other systems? And so we'll have numbers there as well. Thank you. Great. Just to note on the farm to school bill that recently passed, um, the, the bill that had been in place for, uh, is still in place, I guess, for uh, the 2013-15 plan was for $1.2 million and it covered uh, the 19 schools in the state that were able to participate in that program. And the fact that the, the new bill has passed for the next biennium has provided $5 million and has now enabled all schools in Oregon to uh, apply for those funds and use them uh, to be able to provide uh, local programs in their own schools. Nine, 19 schools statewide? Yes. Uh, yes, we have quite a few, and um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're thinking that will expand somewhat, you know, $5 million uh, goes further, but not, so not as far as we'd love to see, uh, but it would really, really help this time around. So at least the, as part of that, uh, the bill is structured so that all schools can have an opportunity and the local schools are really providing some leadership as far as the models of the state. At the uh, school board convention in West Northern, there was a great presentation from the school. But the whole school board members were, I mean, it was a huge evidence. It was a great presentation. I think we have time for one more question. Mr. Chair, so at least a couple months ago you had mentioned to me about a quick dialogue conversation you had with the city of Springfield regarding the uh, tobacco licensing piece. Can you maybe provide an update as, as far as uh, some of the, maybe some of the outreach that's going on with some of the other communities? Um, because I think what we're, what we're interested in, uh, again, if the legislature doesn't come through for the statewide, I think the interest in is a county wide, but making sure that we that all the cities are also on board included so that in a sense the rural areas, as we know we've had a few of those conversations, it doesn't feel like they're being singled out. So can you provide an update of where we are on that? You know, I'll ask Karen to do that, but I will before she gets you the detail, I'll go big picture, which is I'm really happy and staff is uh, taking it on now to follow up with those cities. So we've had some really good conversations with the small cities on this uh, as I get reported back and hear how things are going. But Karen's actually the one out there doing it, so I won't. Okay. Well, I can talk to you a little bit about Springfield, and then let's see if they have some things to add to uh, Christian's stuff on. Uh, the prevention team has really been doing a lot of the follow-up with the cities on this policy. Um, so we have met with the city of Springfield a couple times. They are one of the cities in Lane County that had a pre-existing tobacco retail licensing policy. Um, and part of the impetus right now, they're looking at that policy because they want to integrate e-cigarettes, and so the policy's open, and it's an opportunity for them to consider our language as well. So we've met a couple times with the staff group over there, and um, they're looking at a work session 
perhaps sending it to the Planning Commission first, um, and then uh, with uh, several other things that are on Springfield's agenda right now, we probably wouldn't be able to get time with Council until January. Uh, but, but the staff is very interested in strengthening that policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to get a second thing you said. It's my question about um, are we making a measurable impact? Uh, my, my second area is the impact of, uh, of the uh, seemingly large number of, of suicides. And, and my understanding is that suicides are now replacing murder as the cause of death in Oregon. And whether that's accurate in Lane County and what we're doing to deal with the, uh, this problem in our community. Uh, so, so um, I can't give you specific numbers in terms of if it's replacing the number. But it's true that Lane County has a higher rate than the national average of suicide, so that's true. Um, we um, don't have any um, specific funding to target suicide prevention. However, we do have funding and staff support around promoting mental wellness. For example, Mind Your Mind. Um, that's a, a, that's a local... I thought said Mind Your Own Business. Mind, so. <laughs> mind Your Mind. <laughs> Um, so there's several, actually there's a multi-pronged approach locally to address suicide, but in the context of really where, how do we support one's overall mental wellness. So there are some specific trainings that are being offered. Um, question, persuade, refer, which is TPR. It's a two-hour training. We've offered it many times uh, for county staff as well as many organizations locally, which just really helps people get a better understanding of what to look for if there are signs of suicidal behavior or other kinds of concerning behavior and how do you refer to local appropriate uh, sports. And then also mental health first aid. Um, we contract with a couple of organizations locally like Oregon Family Support Network to conduct those trainings which again is offered to community members at large to help them become better um, familiar with and more informed around various mental illness or mental challenges and know how to appropriately respond. In addition to those trainings, then we have this this campaign, if you will, which locally was developed, the Mind Your Mind Project, which is about just trying to help reduce the stigma associated with accessing and asking for help. That it's, um, you know, pretty normal, actually, for most of us to have experienced at some time in our life something that requires some additional support. So the effort is to try to reduce the stigma associated with asking for support. And then we also got additional funding to, con- to do yet another conference. Um, so last time, as Alicia reported, we did a conference on helping inform the community on reducing adverse childhood experiences, but also promoting mental wellness. The state um, is giving us additional money to do another conference next year to really focus on promoting mental wellness. And what does that look like? What does it really mean to be mentally healthy? So we're trying to do a variety of things uh, because we know that you know, so there's not an easy fix, uh, unfortunately. And it just so happens that September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And so I appreciate you bringing uh, our attention to that because it's a very serious issue. And in our county, like I say, we have a higher rate than the state and the national average, and it's something that we need to look at very closely and very seriously. Thank you. You know, you're asking the question, are we on the right track? We could end this meeting now, yes. So let's go home. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think um, one thing, if, if underneath behavioral health services, and uh, the, uh, the bullet point, the second bullet point down is collaborative efforts, and then the better does the third bullet point down, that is, um, excuse me, the uh, second bullet point down is uh, human services for, uh, commission coordinated front door. Uh, that's a reference to uh, people going to one place to access the, the broad area of services. That's a huge um, undertaking. It's, it's, uh, it's not just us that's doing this. What we are doing is coordinating the entire uh, um, service provider uh, network in, in the broad county. Uh, but that brought up a, something that I talk about quite often and that, um, that I think affects every single one of the uh, areas that we need to report in the 
metric, and that is stable housing. You know, finding uh, finding ways to make sure that people are able to access um, behavioral health services, physical health services, um, suicide prevention services, uh, the various things that we're trying to do. It's really hampered by um, instability in housing. And now, where we might think instability in housing affects just a few people, I think you all know that you, you're, the, you're the ones that don't need this. So it's what I know. But so when we have instability in housing, it affects everybody else because it really makes the services more difficult and more expensive for other people to access when we have frequent, frequent uh, users of the services. So I'll talk often and long about um, housing first and the importance of, the, of our um, human services efforts toward looking at how do we provide housing for people who are behavioral handicapped or who suffer from behavioral health issues on all of our statistics and such. And while there's no real bullet point in here, in the chat, that talks specifically about housing first and that talks specifically about schools and housing, everything really falls down to that. And we talk about it an awful lot. So I'm not going to hop on it or talk about it too much today, but realizing that I'm always going to be thinking about how, how does stability and housing affect um, whatever we're talking about uh, as far as the trip is concerned. And uh, uh, you, know, you heard us talking about it quite a bit this morning, and you heard us talking about it quite often. Um, but uh, stability in housing, uh, providing housing for people who are least able to support themselves, the people who uh, get their medications on January 1st, and by January 15th, their medications are in the middle of care, and they've got two more weeks without medications. Um, whereas if they had a stable, they would have an address with a lot of door, you know, um, maintain, maintain stability in their, in their um, mental health, and maintain stability in their, uh, in their um, uh, just to take care of themselves and this is a very positive thing. So. Appreciate that, Commissioner Barr, and I think um, you know one piece that is true about our chip is this focus on community health and not just health care. And you're right, you bring up social determinants of health um, and a lot of uh, what we talked about in health disparities absolutely relates to the pieces around poverty and homelessness and um, issues of access that really get in the way of people achieving health. No, I'm just going to wait till you cue me to go to the next topic. Well, while we're on this, I have a couple of things. I, 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 one, just sort of a comment on the access to care for the rural areas. I will note that even things that Plain County is not involved in sometimes are through that, and there was a significant effort by the citizens in the Florence area to fundraise and get enough money to expand the emergency room at, at East Harbor Hospital, which is going to do a great job of expanding access to care down there. They, had a grossly undersized emergency room down there, um, which on weekends could get to be a real problem. Um, you know, as we send people there through, through uh, travel lane to ride dunes or whatever else, recreate, and, and uh, had quite an issue there. And, um, you know, and I'd also note the work under that Ford Family Grant of, of the work that was done in Big Coast to assess the health care needs in that area. Yeah, so one of the interesting things is you don't mention the two new federally qualified health clinics because they're not rural, but one of the things I think that that you know, they should be mentioned because they do have an impact. I mean, they provide additional access to primary care providers for folks um, on the Oregon Health Plan. And that may not be just folks in the field. Particularly when you talk about the one that's going to be out at near Delta Highway, that's going to be easily accessible for folks from Junction City and rural areas to reach. Um, so I, I, if you're missing something in there, you might, you might should mention those too. Um, but when you get on to some of the right track stuff, I'm going, to, I'm going to get on one of my favorite bandwagons here and talk about the criminalization of an addictive behavior. And where I do think we're on the right track, and that's in working toward outdoor smoking bans. Um, you know, if we're preventing tobacco use by minors, it should be all adults that are making that choice. But in general, once they're tobacco or nicotine product users, they have an addiction to do it. And I think we're basically criminalizing that behavior by, by making the park stance and all that. And that's an area where I would choose not to pursue a priority in this plan and would not support con 
conversely, I would strongly support a new priority to raise the, the age of legal purchase of tobacco and nicotine products from 21. And that's where I would look for the county ordinance that would be effective within city limits. Whether or not we have the agreement of the city or not, we are the Board of Health. And we do have the ability, as, as the Board of Health, to pass a, a mandated age limit on tobacco sales for this county. I think we need to strongly look at that. I would look at a phased in one because I think once you allow people to be addicted at 18, you shouldn't suddenly tell them that until 21 they're going to be illegal. So I would phase it in year over year so that people could phase out of it. But I think that would have a much stronger impact on our ability to prevent sales to minors if you don't have the kids that are seniors in high school able to go out and legally purchase a product and then resell it to sophomores that aren't legal at age. Um, we did a similar thing with alcohol in this country and it proved very effective in, in that. And I, think, I think we could be a leap on the leading edge and, and getting the state to really stand up and take a look at improving that legal age of purchase up to 21. Much more effective, I think, than banning smoke, smoking in a park that also allows charcoal bills to have far more carcinogenic products coming off of charcoal briquettes than a, a cigarette ever will. I mean, scientifically, that is a much more carcinogenic source of, of pollution. So, yeah, and I know it's about, oh, well, we're seeing those behaviors. Can you imagine if we talked about our camping vans that, that they were a behavior we didn't want our youth to see, the homeless behaviors and model later in life that we spoke of? You know, people sp speak of cigarette smoking that way, but if you flip that and think about homeless people that way, people would be aghast that we're proposing bans on homeless camping purely because we didn't want our kids to see it. And that's the way you guys describe our bans to smoking. We don't want our kids to see that behavior in a minute. I think adults are smart enough to teach their kids that. I think we're going down the wrong path and pushing those top four smoking bans. I would much more prefer to go down the path and change the way to purchase. So, right track, wrong track, that's where I'm going. Commissioner Lincoln. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when we get to the, um, um, and, and I need to, I'm, the reason why I need to, to, to kind of get this out now, because I'm going to have a hard time talking about it. So, um, and this is the, uh, once you get to number three, and the improved community understanding of the impact of the first childhood experiences on mental health, physical health, and addictions. So my sons, in the last two weeks, have lost two classmates, 21 and 23, who died of drug overdose. And um, this is, and I, I talked to them both, and I asked them, how bad is it? And my oldest son, Zach, I think is probably a little bit more and to him, he said, Dad, it's an epidemic. And I said, how does it get started? And he said, well, it may get started through how they've grown up. Maybe a parent died and overdosed, overdosed on so forth. He said, more times than not, they get started on a legal prescription drug for pain. And that leads to the cheap meth and heroin. And both these kids have died from heroin overdose. 21 and 23. And um, so when we get to that, I have to say it now because i got to tell you, I'm having a hard time with this one. I, I personally didn't know the kids, but both my sons did. And, um, you know, I can't even imagine a parent because that's the age of my, both of my boys. My, my youngest will be 21 in, in October. And uh, so when we get to this, this is going to be, I think this is a, a significant issue. That, that is happening, I think, more than what we realize in our in our communities. And when you talk about, and a lot of it is, actually, there's so much of this that's going on in the state of Washington. That's where, that's, that's where the, uh, in a sense, the cartels have landed, and now you have this cheap stuff out there that kids are, are buying, and... Um, 
but it, it really goes to the strategy of, of, of getting it out to the public. So I just want to bring that up now while I can. So and, and just have you think about it once once we get to this. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, like, and I really appreciate you so much bringing voice to that into the room um, because it is it is a huge problem, and we're seeing impacts. Um, all over our state and, and nationally around opiates. And I don't know if there's an opportunity where we want to talk about, kind of similarly to how CA talked about some of the work around suicide, um, there's significant efforts happening on a couple different fronts in our community, um, a piece around treatment access for people who are addicted to opiates. Uh, there's also an effort to really work with healthcare providers in the community to approach chronic pain very differently so that um, to an extent that there are people in our community who have become addicted through prescriptions um, that we end that practice. There are new guidelines coming out um, that are expected to hit in January um, that will really influence how that prescribing happens so that we can keep that from happening in the first place. And then really what's the prevention piece we can do whether it's through addressing those early childhood trauma or other things that make kids vulnerable to becoming addicted in the first place. There's there's a lot to do, absolutely. And if I could just add one more, I, I apologize. If I could just add one more thing here. So a couple, a couple uh, of my son's friends did have a, they, they went to a problem. They actually became addicted to heroin. And they're 23 today. Well, it just wasn't the support of the, uh, uh, their families. They, can, they have good families, so this can happen to anybody. I think what happened is that was my son and his buddies called them on the carpet. So not only did they have support from their, from the, uh, from their family, they had a support group from their pals who basically called them out and got them into rehab. And now, and understanding that they're weak, so even going through rehab, they're still going to, still going to have challenges. So also, they gave to set up these accountability networks. Twenty-three-year-old kids realizing that they're buddies, unless they have this accountability. Sorry, <laughs> this network in place. Those boys may relapse, and may that same issue may happen to them. I mean, it's pretty amazing to see. So th this one really. Is, is, a, is a stinger and, and again we talked this morning about the future, our future generation and so on and so forth by the way the two kids and I know them personally and they are great kids I mean they're smart they're intelligent they're the whole works it's amazing on, on how that can just that can just grab a hold of you but I just and I'll, and I'll leave it at that so that might lead me to a question I wanted to ask a little bit and that's um how is the, you know, we just approved the behavioral health and criminal justice system plan last week. I had a great presentation from Lisa and, uh, and Tim Lally. And how does that integrate with the community health improvement plan? You said you want to take a shot or a joint I had to deal with some of those issues. So, that so, so I really was boring because I covered it. <laughs> Let me go back and read to you again. It seemed to work so well the first time. Isn't it addressing the intersection between behavioral health and, uh, criminal, and the criminal justice? So, so that is, well, I probably, you can take it. So we're not criminalizing our mental health population. So currently we're serving about 130 people in our um, jail intercept program at Lane County Behavioral Health. And so our plan is to continue to expand that program and work with more. Um, so we're currently working with uh, Lane County Jail. Um, we're also working with Junction City, um, a little bit of Springfield. So whatever we can do to increase that population and provide more support. Of the folks that we're currently serving, I think we've had five this survey who haven't stayed engaged in the program and have went back out and we haven't been up to so I guess what I would add is I think that when you identified as your chip priority a focus on people who are homeless and people in the corrections system, that was really the signal to 
our department that that was your priority. And so as we worked with the PSCC and and our own internal planning, that absolutely was the guide to how we proceeded. So we've gone after grants to help support those efforts. We've um, worked with the summit group to develop a plan. So it, from my perspective, it really is integrated into the chip. That work is, is absolutely um, one and the same. And, and we've tried to you know, have that behavioral health focus and, and you can use that terminology and be all inclusive. So um, addictions treatment um, is included in that. It's, it's not purely mental health treatment we're looking at. It's all of those components that can affect an individual um, and then trying to address that that whole person. Mm -hmm. I, 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 as usual, I sort of knew the answer. I kind of wanted to have it brought out, though, that that, that, you know, that plan we approved last yeah. week unanimously was really part of, the, you know, started from, from our chip priorities. And in addition, it helped address some of the issues that Commissioner Lightning brought up about addiction, because quite a bit of that behavior helped. I'm sure those 130, mm -hmm. you know, how many, what percentage of those would you say have an addiction issue? Oh, oh. Probably 75% of those. Yes. Yeah. And also the tap on to what Commissioner Lakin said. We're currently right now expanding our Lane County Methadone Treatment Program, where we're going to be able to serve an additional 50 people in our program. And I know that doesn't address, you know, the prevention side of it, but as far as the intervention side of it, we're able to connect with other folks in the community and educate. We're constantly educating our community about ways for prevention. So we're trying to address those needs, and we're aware that it's increasing. And more and more, the folks that we're serving are the folks that you're talking about. Probably 20% of the people have been on prescription medication because of an accident or some other event that's happened, not because they started out in the system. Um, and so we're seeing that more and more. Uh, we will work on recognizing softballs next time. Uh, did you want to do any introduction before we get started? Sure. Um, I noticed after we got started that a member of your public health advisory committee joined us. So do you want to introduce yourself? I don't know if you've met all the board yet. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I'm Allie. I'm a retired from private practice here on the way to the board. Because obviously our public health advisory committee also has a big stake in the chip in our community. So I appreciate you being here today, Pat. All right, so shall we go to the next round of slides? Because this is going to be the fun stuff for you guys to talk about, I promise. Not that this wasn't fun. Okay, but Commissioner Bozovich is very excited about these next couple of slides. Um, so, uh, during the last several uh, public health or board of health meetings, uh, when we've been talking about tobacco retail licensing, there have been um, ideas about different things we could do, and we kept saying, let's talk about that in a work session on the chip. So here we are today, and um, we have two specific strategies that we heard you raise, and then certainly, uh, you know, I think the third one is this issue of increasing the smoking age to 21. There's lots of evidence out there that we can bring back to you as well if you um, want to talk about those. But there were two strategies that different commissioners uh, identified in the last few months that we put material in your packet on. Uh, the first is around, um, well, so, so basically they're both on tobacco-free um, outdoor spaces. Um, so as a reminder, the tobacco-free campus policy is um, kind of a broad policy for all properties, indoor and outdoor, and then county-free parks could be a subset of that. So those were the two different ideas that um, I've heard you raise in the past. Um, and uh, just by way of information, um, they were both in the CHIP strategies, the community-wide CHIP strategies. Uh, in 2014, which was our most recent community survey, there was 74% support among registered voters for outdoor public places. I know people have different opinions on surveys, um, but that's uh, what the survey data told us. 
Uh, and then, of course, each of those policies would have unique implementation issues, and um, so we're going to talk about each of them in turn pretty quickly. Um, so the first is around a tobacco-free campus policy, uh, and these policies typically prohibit all tobacco use and smoking. So now as we talk about those terms in Lane County, we define tobacco to include e-cigarettes um, in your ordinance. Uh, smoking would also include uh, smoking anything. Um, so it's wide open on both of those topics, indoor and outdoor. And they apply a tobacco-free campus policy would typically apply to the general public as well as employees. Currently, the state of Oregon and seven counties have such policies, and um, some counties have adopted those policies administratively and some by ordinance, so it's kind of a variety. Uh, here in Lane County, during the last couple years, uh, there's been a staff committee that worked on a draft policy for the county administrator's consideration on creating uh, a county tobacco-free campus policy. Uh, that work included conducting a staff survey, looking at best practices uh, from across the country and uh, learning some from health and human services experience uh, where we've had tobacco-free campuses on our properties for the last several years, probably more than that now. Um, and ultimately, any final policy would need to be bargained uh, with the county's labor unions prior to implementation. A successful rollout for these policies, uh, based on what we've learned from other communities, is that it would need to include good communication, um, promotion of cessation resources. I think we've talked before with the Board of Health um, how survey after survey really shows that most people who smoke want to quit, um, so we would want to do a lot of promotion of what the resources are that we provide, um, both for our employees through our benefits program, but also out in the community through the quit line and other things uh, for cessation. And then do staff training and signage, and for the most part, jurisdictions really treat these policies as self-enforcing. So you put up signs, let people know what the policy is, train staff to be able to tell people about the policy, um, but it isn't one where jurisdictions have hired more people to police it or enforce it or do any of those things. So that's the tobacco-free campus policy, and then a tobacco-free parks policy um, could be covered under a larger tobacco-free campus policy or could be a standalone um, parks-only policy. A number of jurisdictions have been adopting these policies, and uh, many others are currently considering that policy. In Lane County currently, I know City of Benita and Willamalee Parks and Rec have adopted um, a tobacco-free parks policy, and several other jurisdictions are considering those. And I think in your packet, we provided you a list statewide of the most recent tobacco-free parks policies. And again, <coughs> excuse me, rollout and enforcement of these policies is pretty much the same as the tobacco-free campus policy. So you put up signs, inform people of the policy, and it's pretty much self-enforcing. So um, that's at a high level information about those two policies that I've heard commissioners ask about. Um, and then this is kind of the, um, is there any interest in bringing any additional strategies back um, to the Board of Health for consideration this year or any questions you have about this? And it doesn't certainly doesn't have to just be about those two policies. So 
citizens against this citizen here, you know, and the police themselves, you know, they can understand that there's a dynamic behind it a little bit. Uh, with regard to the two that you had up here, the, the uh, smoke-free uh, workplace and the um, and the uh, parks, it seems like uh, on the parks, if we could get somebody maybe who works in the state parks, uh, is it a division or a department? I think they're in the department. Um, that if we can get somebody that works at state parks in Lane County to come to the meeting, and maybe when I'm in Lane and one of those city uh, representatives from either Cottage Grove or Benita or give us some sort of state, district, city kind of perspective on. You know, when did they put this into effect? How is it working? Uh, how are the patrons feeling about it? The visitors, park users, uh, that sort of thing. I, I can say, um, you know, for me, it really makes the park experience not that great if someone's smoking. So for me, as a non-smoker, you know, my park experience is, is degraded by having smokers there. Um, but I'm interested in, in hearing how it actually works. We don't really have to plow a whole lot of new ground on that. If it's working and there isn't a lot of pushback and they've implemented it, then it seems to me that with the work session we're able to ask all the questions about it. And, uh, now the uh, workplace one, what you call it campus? Right. Why is it called campus as opposed to work? Um, well, we talk about it as a campus both because it's indoor and outdoor, but also because it's not just employees. It's um, so work, workplace kind of implies it's our employees, but it okay. also applies to the general public who use those facilities. Uh, so it is true that it is a workplace, but it's also a public place. Right. Okay. So, so the word campus tries to Embody work of that? I think so. Okay, pretty cool. Okay. Um, I was never really smart enough to work on campus. You want to be like Google. Cool That's to right. Know. You know. Cool to know. <laughs> um, so on, on that, on on smoking, what, what, what's, what are the current rules? Where can you smoke on lane? You know, can you smoke in a car? Can you smoke in a... Paris Hall, and where can you smoke? So Lane County and CA will provide more detail to the usual. I'll start with the big yeah, picture and see if you can the details. So um, Lane County certainly has to abide by the Oregon Indoor Clean Air Act. So there's um, no use of cigarettes or cigars inside of county buildings um, or within 10 feet of an entrance or vent, except for inside the city of Eugene. It's a 25-foot barrier. Um, so the 10 feet that the state indoor clean air ban, right? Um, what else? So, we used to have a sign, I've been here so long, we used to have a sign right over there where the fire uh, alarm and it said, no smoking in public buildings or public meetings. There you go. Yeah. Because that was the first phase, no smoking in public mm -hmm. meetings. Now well, there's the signs outside the building that says no smoking within 10 feet. Okay. So that's, that's the new messaging. Okay, so no smoking. And is that for all county buildings? Um, that's for all buildings in the state of Oregon. Oh, okay. so all public buildings. All public buildings. Okay. Um, all, yes. So um, there's, as I said, there's been work done in the last couple of years, um, lots of conversations in different staff groups about what a policy could look like. Like, and I don't know if the county administrator wants to talk about that. Well, are we talking about county roads or county buildings? Or what are we talking about? So the draft policy right now um, is very similar to what the tobacco-free campus policies look like in other parts of the state. So it would be basically on all property owned or operated by the county. County road. County park. Um, county park, yes. I don't know yeah, that the policy would specify roads so much. Um, but it's all county property but not roads. Yeah. 
Is that a policy in place somewhere else? Uh, there are seven counties that have, I think that, that was the number I said, right? Seven counties um, that have that policy in the state of Oregon. What about cities? I'm sure there are, but I could not tell you. Where we can do the same thing on the parks on this. We could have the people that have these policies in place, and maybe one or two counties, maybe some cities within one county, and have them tell us how it's working and how they enforce it and whether they think it's doing the job. Mm -hmm. So, and I'd like to know the extent of it because I'm, I'm, I'm serious about asking about, you know, county facilities. Is this the fairgrounds? Is this the county roads? Are these the right of ways? Where, where's the limit on this? And where's the best bang for the buck? It seems to me that if you had such a huge policy and no smoking on county roads, that now you're getting intruding on people's personal freedoms and it's not really bringing that much public health benefit where, you know, having a cloud of smoke outside of a government building because it's against a lot of smoke close to a government building, but you're still going to have to go through a cloud of smoke to get to it. To me, that's not fair to, to the public that's trying to do something about this this horrible, you know, uh, impact of tobacco on our lives. Mr. Leiper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, uh, I saw smoke-free and tobacco-free. So, smoke-free, that's pretty easy. So, tobacco-free, does that carry, does that also include each and Copenhagen? Yes. Okay. Does that include on baseball fields, or? I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I, I think I'm interested, I, Commissioner Swanson think brings up something I think is would be worthwhile, and that is maybe bring in some folks who deal with this already and, and how they enforce it. Juan Lane is, is it, as we know, is its own independent um, uh, tax base. Uh, they also work very closely with uh, Springfield PD in the city, so on the enforcement side, but I'm still going to guess it's going to still be uh, somewhat complaint driven. That would be my guess. Uh, it's also, I think, when you look at parks and so on and so forth, there's quite a lot of pride involved, so I think community members as a whole probably would see the signs and say, okay, we don't want to smoke here. But with that being said, I, I would agree. I think it would be worthwhile maybe just to check in with those who already operate, especially from a, from a county perspective. Um, you know, we have a large county. And, and how would we enforce that? I mean, how, how is that able to be enforced? And, and is it mainly comp complaint driven? And, and with the lack of resources of public safety, how would that be taken care of and so on and so forth? So I, I, I would agree. I think that's a, that's a good idea. And just to, just to ask, okay, how is this done? And, and how, do you, how do you take care of it? So I, would, I, I think that's worthwhile having that conversation on how it's enforced, especially in the parks and, and particularly in the rural, the rural area of Lane County. So I'll, I'll jump in again once, once again on this. You, know, you can do a survey that will basically tell you that a majority of people in Lane County would support an anti-panhandling ordinance because they don't like seeing those people in the pants. We all know that it's not constitutional. But a certain majority of people will tell us that. You know, I mean, having a majority of people say they like something doesn't mean it's necessarily it's something we can and should do. Um, and and I, I still go back to, I think, what we're trying to do here is criminalizing victim's behavior. And, and it's no different than you know, people that complain that we're criminalizing homelessness with their anti-camping ordinances and all those county doesn't have one to sleep does. Um, so I, I, I really think this is the wrong place to be pushing. The other thing is we are going to have some difficult negotiations over the next several years with our employee bargaining units. I don't want to argue about smoke-free workplaces or tobacco bans. Why add that issue in with some very difficult issues about um, new construction?
insurance programs and other issues that we have to deal with, COLAs, whatever else. I don't want the member handing them an issue that they're going to want to get back on. But okay, we'll, we'll let you in, in do that, but this is what we want in exchange for that. I'm sorry, that's, that's a non-starter for me. I don't want to deal with the bargaining units on this. I don't think it's a fair thing. When we talk about county parks, you know, the city of Benita has a state park. And they have a specific reason why they're looking for a smoking ban. It's about controlling some of their youth behaviors at that city state park. You know, and have to be able to basically immediately identify almost anyone that's in there smoking and get, it, get them out of there. You know, that's what that's what they're doing. We've got campgrounds. But we're asking adults to stay for nights at a time where the closest place that's off-site could be a half mile away out of Richardson Park or something like that. Are we going to ask adults to come stay in Lane County that are, you know, coming with their tourist dollars and camping in our campgrounds and, and ask them not to, to somehow or another stop their addictive behaviors for a few days because they have to be in a county park? I don't think it's realistic. And I, I really think this is all going in the wrong direction. I would, I would rather spend our energy and time on, a, on something that will have a realistic impact. And like Commissioner Stewart says, we've got legalized marijuana coming down the pipe right now, recreational marijuana. One of the ways of consuming that is eating vaping products. How do you tell the difference between an 18-year-old with a vaping device that's using nicotine products or THC products? And how does the police defer, you know, define that? To me, if we if we work on the tobacco usage up to age 21, it's consistent. Then they see somebody using something that looks like an a, a, a inhaling device of any kind, whether it's you know, smoking it or you know, that generates smoke or generates vapor. They know that person if they're under 21 is not legally consuming that that product. Whether it's nicotine, THC, you know, it doesn't matter. So, you know, and you know, they're even looking at THC infused alcohol products now too, which is just insane. But um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it'd be nice to have consistency. I think that that I would much rather have our health and human services department and this board expend their energy on the age limit than on banning an outdoor use of legally a legal product for adults and a product that people are addicted to. You know, so that's just where I, I come down on this. I have a couple of questions. Um, just a statement. Um, cigarettes have been the leading cause of death in the Wayne County, the United States. Is that true? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you know, how many people have smoked on a plane recently? You don't, and there was a time when you don't have plane and you know, smoke. How many people have smoked in Austin Stadium? You know, I mean, we're asking people to go to a football game and spend three or four hours of their life and not smoke a cigarette, not indulge in their addictive behavior, or asking people to get on planes and not smoke a cigarette for four or six or eight hours and not indulge in their addictive behavior. I, I understand, you know, my mom and dad were addicted to cigarettes, and probably most of our moms and dads were addicted to cigarettes, and I couldn't imagine what my dad would have done if he just said, well, you can't smoke any place in a park in Lane County, or a park any place. You know, it would have been very difficult for him. Um, but that being said, uh, I, we have to be bold about it. You know, we've got a leading part of the in the nation, in the world, uh, at our fingertips here, and if we can do things to cause people to choose not to smoke, you know, um, what are the reasons people decide not to smoke? What are the reasons people decide to tackle their addiction? Don't take any addiction, let's take alcohol. What are the reasons that people choose to decide to quit doing whatever it is that's killing them off slowly or quickly? So you make it harder for them to do it is one way to do it. One way is to convince them that they're killing themselves. It doesn't always work, but sometimes, you know, that's just not enough. So if you make it harder for people to do it, you know, you, you want it to be harder for people to drive, then you make gas more expensive or make it less available. You want, it, uh, you want, you want people to stop smoking, you make it, make, it, make it harder for people to smoke cigarettes. And uh, you can do it by raising costs, or you can do it by, um, by prohibiting that. And, you know, the, uh, the fact is, it's going to be, we're going to have backlash. 
and people are going to say, I'm an adult. I chose to smoke. I'm addicted to cigarettes. How can you tell me not to? Well, you know, there are things that we tell people not to do all the time, and there are things that we have to take a turn. And for me, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, almost a moral stance on it. You know, if I'm going to um, put the chip up on the board, if I'm going to identify tobacco cessation as one of the main things that we want to do in Lane County, I'm going to try to explore every way that we can do it. And, uh, and to me, um, Commissioner Sanchez says smoking in the parks is uh, a fun sound, or makes it less enjoyable than smoking in the park. I agree with that. I'm the case. I can, personally, I can pick out a cigarette, you know, 100 feet away, not 25 feet away. And, and it really is distasteful to me. But uh, that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it so that people are going to live longer lives, and we're doing it so that people are going to uh, not cost us more money as a society by having the emergency room or having shortened lives or having to go on some form of uh, long-term chronic health care plan that costs everybody a lot of money. And so doing it whatever we can, whenever we can, and however we can, I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of that in every single way that we can. So... If I'm uh, going into it with our eyes open and it's going, there's going to be a backlash on it, I'm, I'm fine with the backlash on that too. But uh, if we're going to make the statement, if we're going to do it, if we're going to choose the, one of the main points of our community help us, we've got to do it all the way, I believe, and I think, uh, I think we're going about it correctly. I think we're trying to explore ways to do it in, in a fashion that makes it more acceptable, by, by making it more um, universal. You know, having a uh, tobacco ordinance that works in the county. Uh, that's only in the county, that doesn't work. Having it uh, only in the outside of the south, that doesn't work. You know, it's got to be in the city. It's got to, make, it's got to be more uniform. It's got to be direct in our approach to it. So for me, um, I fully understand what Mr. Bowles is saying. You know, people do have choices. People make choices. But I believe that uh, one of the choices that I've made is that I'm going to support the community health improvement plan. And uh, one of the main elements of that is tobacco cessation. And I'm, and I'm behind every single thing that we want to do as far as tobacco cessation is concerned. At the, at the cost of having to explain myself to people who are addicted to cigarettes. I just want to note that I looked up the uh, smoking rules at a campground of America campground, and uh, smoking is not allowed in any building or pool area. I know that. So apparently you can't smoke near the pool or in the building, but you can smoke elsewhere in the KOA. Um, and maybe there's different rules at different KOAs, but that's the uh, one. Is that I wanted to go back and add to sort of the parks and the, and the campus. We got that, in my view. But I wanted to go back to that uh, uh, tobacco ordinance. Well, we went through all that. There was a lot of discussion of the uh, impact of our previous ordinance on tobacco retailers on the borders of cities and the unincorporated Lane County. And one suggestion was, well, it's a good ordinance, but it hurts those people on the, those retailers on that on that frontier, on that imaginary line. So I was hoping that we could get on to our next round of this plan to have our expansion of it to include all of Lane County rather than just the unincorporated part of Lane County. And we could bring back some of the other features of the first uh, ordinance. And, and that way we wouldn't have the frontier problem, the just out of town, just inside of city problem that a number of those retailers were mentioned. I didn't really go along with that, but do that as a may. That was an argument that was persuasive to the board at the time. And now, hey, we were told at the time, well, we, we could revisit this in the future. Well, to me, today's a good day to talk about that future and get that going and and and, and have the discussion uh, where we believe this will have some positive effect on the community, to be well within our authority to do it, and we got to keep moving on that. So 
wrap up. No, I'm, I'm, I just heard a couple of things that I, I don't know how uh, commissioners you want to move forward or direct staff, but um, so I've heard there's some interest in uh, hearing from others who have done park and campus um, uh, tobacco free, uh, such as Rhode Island State in some of the small cities, and maybe you go just uh, to come and talk about uh, kind of hearing themes and questions. I could be completely down the wrong path, so my feelings will not, well, they will be hurt, but it's okay. Um, but but uh, do you achieve what you'd hope? Um, how do you enforce it? Uh, there are a couple of themes that I'd heard. Um, I also heard that looking at the 21, raising the age 21, I know uh, Chris Rose, a few, uh, number of years ago, I gave you a, I showed you a report where some cities in a county, uh, East Coast, I believe, had done that. So if you'd like us to come back with a report on who else is, maybe who else is doing it, what would be the, uh, how, we, how we might roll something like that. Not a lot of in-depth work yet, but does it make sense uh, kind of looking at, seeing if it's done somewhere else. Uh, and then um, yeah, Commissioner Shredson just touched on how we're doing with the cities. So I don't know if you want to uh, make a report back on well, I've actually heard not a how we're doing with the cities, but in looking at would the Board of Health adopt a countywide policy. So there we go. So those, those are the four things that have been sort of floating around. It sounds like there's kind of a, a bit of a split support for whether or not we continue you know, looking at the, the outdoor smoking ban. Right. It sounds like one of that is to gain some more information around it. Um, I, you know, I kind of, I won't go back and, and beat it that horse again, but there are unintended consequences of that, of banning smoke inducing parts also. The parents and the grandparents that don't bring the kids for healthy outdoor activities because they can't smoke in the park. So I'd, I'd like to see kind of a little bit whether or not there's been reduced park usage after ban. Um, we're looking at some of the data from other from other agencies, um, but I think it sounds like we need to have a follow-up work session, possibly specifically discuss um, tobacco um, future efforts, and, and one is whether to continue to pursue, to pursue the uh, parks and, and the campus ban. And, Lane County campus bans, and also whether we want to pursue an age um, increase in Lane County as the Board of Health Amendment. And I guess the fourth thing is, is where we are with moving ahead on trying to get a Butter County um, retail license. Um, and, and, that, and, that, and once we get there, then we can talk about bringing back in some of the things that cause border issues. Um, you know, relative to the tobacco ordinance to be pulled out. Um, I think that was the four items I heard too. Um, um, at the risk of prolonging the discussion, I guess I'd like to try to get some clarity from the board on uh, where your priorities lie. Um, if, if there is really no desire to move forward on um, one or both of those areas, I would be smoke for your track of the campus issue or the raising of the age issue. I guess, do you have a priority on one of those two as a board? Uh, I don't know if there's consensus there. Right. I think I, I express my priorities very clearly. <laughs> and I'm, I'm pushing on this one because I think it's important that we try to get, we try to understand where you're at today. My fear is that we go forward and we do a lot of good work in gathering this important information to help the board make a decision, but ultimately if it, if it doesn't lead with the, with the understanding this is an informal tool of the board's desires and not a decision that we are making because we are in a work session. Um, you know, I'll, I'll turn to my fellow board members maybe express their priorities um, to staff so that staff has clear understanding and maybe the sense to board. I've been among them for a while. And, uh, and when the, the problem with Monmouth was independence of Rhinos and Monmouth. I know, yeah, right, right. And uh, you know, Monmouth was a uh, dry town in the Cummins Walton. And the, the stores were so close to each other that points of view, they didn't get some form of visit. 
um, so the Commission sometimes talks about frontiers, and I think uh, we're going to eliminate frontiers. That's, that's going to help us down the road. It's going to help with our efforts. Um, so um, I think uh, I, I wish we had a not just a 21 year old smoking ban, I wish we could have a smoking ban period in the entire nation. But, uh, and so until we do that, I, I don't know if we'd be able to know what's going on in the region. You know, it's like whatever the frontier may be. If we had a 21, a, a 21 year limit, a year old limit on smoking in, in Lane County, where that bears the interest of it, would be a busy spot. You know, it's like, uh, so, you know, I, I guess um, I'd be interested in discussion, discussing it and discussing what the, the thoughts are on that. But, um, to me, it's, uh, as unilateral as we can be with our smoking regulations, but I think we be better off without it. Of all the things that we've talked about, I think um, finding a, a way to make a health board to make um, our smoking governments countywide from border to border is uh, probably the best way to spend our efforts. So um, I, I would just say that, you know, Steve is pushing us for a priority. I would say, you know, the, the, the parks, campus, expanding the county's uh, tobacco uh, ordinance, you know, those are, those are three. But I also am, am interested in hearing if there's any way. Uh, you had two. Uh, you had two up there, right? Okay. So we've already broadened it to three. And so I would just answer the question, well, I could keep going. And we heard, uh, we heard at least one commissioner talk about substance abuse and the uh, use of, 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 uh, of opiates. opiates and the misuse of opiates, or maybe the use leading to the misuse, and uh, creating problems. I expressed my point of view on the topic of, of suicides and, and uh, how that seems to be a bigger and bigger number. And but I guess in answer to your question, you know, you can have five people giving five to the fifth power of opinions of what should be done, but there are limits on what can be done. And I think we've given you three that that are. You know, where at least some plurality of the board is interested in hearing more about it and having work sessions on it and getting to the bottom of whether it's a, uh, got, got some problems that haven't been foreseen yet by these other agencies or, or maybe these other agencies are experiencing problems and since they've enacted them, to be fair. And so we'd like to hear about their experiences. So those, you know, those are three. But just to broaden that to these substance abuse and uh, other mental health issues. I'm not really sure that that falls into this category because it really hasn't been vetted by staff. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. So I would say, yeah, get, get back to me on all those five. You can do it by the end of the week. That would be really good. It's not a problem. <laughs> I mean, really, in this hypothetical world, you know, yeah. And What's on all of it? I would say it's absolutely part of why we're back here today it, because we have about a year, a little bit less than that, to wrap up this chip. And so the administrator asked, are there, you know, looking at the whole chip, if we pull the lens back a little bit, are there some things that are important to you as the Board of Health and your charge to improve the health in the community that you really want us to focus on? So, um, so yes, this is the opportunity to tell us whatever that is. Where's diabetes in this, for example? Isn't that an epidemic too? It is absolutely an important health problem. So, and I think put that on the list. <laughs> <laughs> By Friday, did you say? I think it's going to get us till Tuesday. Yeah. 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 Our goal is to narrow, though. Oh, narrow. Yeah. 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 I'd like to, 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 to bring it back to where we were, which is we already talked about what's the existing chip and then had a moment or two to say, is it the right direction or wrong direction on the existing steps we're taking? And I believe there was a strategy around um, managing 
chronic diseases in that ship, which would include diabetes, by the way. Um, so it's, it's not about, it's, you know, we'll go back and look at the first part of this presentation. Was so there something I missed there? And the, and the follow-up discussion now is what are our priorities? You know, and out of that existing presentation, you know, we had put those five priorities last two years ago. Um, you know, it, you know, was there something there that's missing or something new you want to add? And then that's what the second part of the discussion is, is where should our priorities be in the next couple of years of the chip? And, and that's the discussion about you know, continuing the efforts with the tobacco-free campuses and the um, uh, tobacco-free parks. Um, you know, and I brought something new into it, which was what the request was, is, is there something new, which is raising the age of sales of tobacco and nicotine products to 21, because I think it would have a very large impact, I think more impactful than the tobacco-free campuses and parks did, personal feeling. Um, you know, is there something new? You know, there is. There are already strategies around addiction treatment and, and, and drug use prevention. Is there a new piece that maybe somebody wants to bring to it? So that's kind of the question we're at right now with the board. And we've and we kind of discussed in our sort of roundabout way four strategies that kind of fit in the, the new priorities, you know, which was tobacco-free campuses for Lane County workplaces, tobacco-free Lane County parks, um, raising the age of the purchase of tobacco and nicotine products at 21, and then also working with the cities to um, get our tobacco ordinance to be fully countywide so we can bring back in things like the coupons and uh, other border issue things that were pulled out of that um, ordinance because of that concern. So that, those were the four we heard. So if there's something that wasn't in the existing plan or something we haven't discussed, that's what we're looking for. But in addition, I think you know, the administrator is asking, some of those four things we discussed, is there kind of a, a, a ranking of the, of the commissioners that they personally would like to see so that we're not sending staff off to go look into an item that, say, only one commissioner is interested. Like, I think I'm the only well, commissioner who expressed some interest in the age thing, but I haven't heard, I haven't heard any other commissioners express strong interest in the, in the age. Um, Although I think that would probably be one of the easiest things we could pass. It would be a very, very simple mo motion that the Board of Health pass that and we can put it in the link code. Um, but, so that, that's what we're looking for here is a sense of the board. You know, those four items, is there one of them that you, know, you just not interested in at all? One of them rises to the top and stuff? Or is there a fifth item you want to bring in that we haven't already discussed as part of the existing chip? Well, I think it's clear that the direction that you've gone so far with the trip, we're all fully behind it. Um, I don't think there's any question about that. But when you had the six strategies up there, you had your color coding, color coding. There were items up there that you hadn't addressed yet, that you are fully intending to address. You don't really need comments on that. Uh, Unless that, you think you there's some of those that, that aren't worth doing. Get out of here. I don't think so. <laughs> no, I think everything you listed there that you're working on, continue to work on for me personally. And as far as, uh, you know, um, uh, you, you look at uh, the trip itself. I, I'm looking at page 26 right now. Preventing reduce obesity. Well, you know, obesity is the second part of preventable. That, that's that's um, I think it's right there. I mean, the thing, the the other things that we may talk about are pretty pretty much already contained in the trip. You're already working on them. You've already listed them up there. You've either done them, you've addressed them, or you're going to address them. Keep doing it. And then, uh, as far as other things that, that, that you'd like us to add, I think uh, the one thing we've really talked about so far is surrounding uh, number one, which is tobacco. And uh, there are five other areas there. And we've got 45 minutes out of two hours left to go. So, um, so I don't know, do you want us to go into the other, all of those areas, or is it wide open at this point in time? We have 15 minutes out of two hours. Okay. <laughs> sure, Barb, truly, um, from our perspective as staff, we're here to support the Board of Health in your priorities. So yeah. we'll, we'll bring you the evidence uh, as best we know it about what works and what doesn't work, and then, and then do the legwork to implement whatever your priorities are. So it's our opportunity to get that sense from you, and, and yes, I know today's a work session, so there's not a motion in front of you, um, but we're happy to bring back whatever is your pleasure. It's pretty simple. Two things, uh, 50 unit uh, housing for uh, complex and the downtown farmer's market. I'll go home. So 
Well, I, I think on the tobacco, I, I think I would have an interest in the, the 20 20 issue. Um, I, I do have a very strong interest, though, on how these other organizations do enforce this. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to make sure that, you know, if we decide to move forward on something, it would, let's just make sure it's just more than just words. And so I'd be interested just to, just to clarify and, and just to give it a, more of that information. I think the 21 piece, I really never thought much about it until Jay brought this up, even from our prior discussions. I, I think from that perspective, it makes sense. I also believe, though, that Christian Farr brought up something that, that you, you don't even think about. I think Austin Stadium really is uh, one of your examples. It's a perfect example. Uh, I mean, not only is there not smoking in Austin Stadium, there's no umbrellas in Austin Stadium. Of course, it never rains in Austin Stadium, according to Austin Stadium. So, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it's interesting that uh, I think what we'll find is that uh, the patterns of behavior changes. If there's something there that, that uh, and you're talking about that just out of pure niceness, I guess, for lack of a better word, to, to, other, to other folks, most people do not smoke. And, uh, you know, I'm one of them. I never took it out. That was just something I never did. It just never interested me. But the, the reality is it's still a legal product in, in this country. Uh, I'm glad we're not in Virginia, North Carolina discussing this. I don't think we would be discussing this, but we're here in Oregon. So I think, that, so I think just that whole idea of the way uh, people's behaviors change and how, by just something that simple. But given that, we're not just talking about Austin Stadium. I mean, we're, we're talking about Lane County. Lane County's a big county. It's with a fairly significant rural or urban area. And if we're gonna if we're talking about the entire county, then I think we need to make sure that there's whatever we decide to do, there's gotta be a little teeth involved here. And that's why I have the interest of the enforcement side. So but the twenty one I'm interested in, I think that, that would make sense. Uh, and I would say that I would agree with Mr. Bozovich, it's probably an easy, it's maybe one of the easiest changes. Uh, but then just to bring back the information on the enforcement side and, and, and kind of go from there. That's, so I guess my, what I'm suggesting is, is fairly simple, I guess, but I, 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 from, I guess from my perspective, it's just making sure you, you gather that information. Whether Willamette well, Lane is the right app, right piece or not to bring in to talk about the enforcement, I don't know. But at least uh, I think you'll have some park professionals that can probably add maybe add a little content to it as well, along with our with our staff. So that's just my thoughts. Mr. Stewart, you're ready? Yes. All right, that's good. Um, I, I still have energy around making a county-wide ordinance that works. Um, and I do support the conversation about the age, and I also would like to see more information about parks. And so I see a little bit there. It's a little bit of a selfish piece by me, and I don't want to park the cutting show, and I can see the adverse impact of that. And uh, the city is some probably new jurisdiction, but uh, I can see where that um, yeah, has its plus and minus, and I'll actually discuss it further. So it sounds like all four still. Is that year yeah, four? Yeah, I wasn't seeing it. I wasn't seeing it. We do it. Yeah, we do it. Yeah. Okay, should we talk about Trillium now? Do you want to, are we ready to go to the third part of our discussion? Sure. Sure, I think we're ready. If that's what there's any further comments from Trillium. I'd just like to reiterate the work on the chip is amazing. You know, I mean, when I talk about it and with other people outside of this county, they, they cannot believe how much work has been done and how steadfast you have been in, in uh, administering it and how the entire county is working with it and, and uh, the tactics that people use in their daily work, everything rolls back into the trip. And the trip rolls right into the county strategic plan. I mean, everything is, is uh, kind of um, moving in a linear fashion. And uh, 
that we kind of talk back and forth a lot about the kind of nuances around the edge, but by and large, the tip is it's like double thumbs up wherever I go. Nobody, everybody else wishes they had something like that. So. Thank you, Commissioner. And I appreciate the fact that our um, subject matter experts and leaders in the department were able to be here today because that um, really that's the only way that the amount of work that we've been able to accomplish has happened is that these folks have stepped up and said, okay, we'll, we'll do that too. Um, and so I appreciate the big lift from all of you very much. You give me something to talk about at just about every dinner party I go to. <laughs> 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 so, so it's so going to be the update. <laughs> so, at, at the last, at your last board meeting last week, not your last one, that will be today. Uh, you had a couple of questions, Commissioner Lichen. You brought up about the Gilliam sale and what does that mean. So, we put together a few items that we want to just touch on. If this works, great. If you need more, we're willing to. Uh, uh, put more effort into and bring more folks to the table for the discussion of uh, whatever works with you. But given the Karen's and leadership in this area, we thought we'd use her expertise and let her do the shot. And I did talk with Terry Copeland yesterday and mentioned his questions that you had last week, and he's absolutely happy to come back and have a conversation with you if you would like that. So, um, so what I understood you had questions about um, was the specific transition to um, from Agate to Centene, and that purchase uh, did go into effect uh, September 1st. That changeover happened, so we're a little less than a month into it. Uh, the governance of Trillium itself hasn't changed in terms of the board composition. Uh, Lane County continues to have three seats on that board of directors. Um, and Lane County, in our administrative services agreement with Trillium, our contract with them uh, specifies that we will have representation on all of their committees. Um, and then, uh, aside from the contract, since the beginning of Trillium, uh, we've had representation on the internal senior management team as well. So we're, we continue to be involved at the policy level and the governance uh, structure as well as the management team. I know we've talked with you before about county staff who are paid to that administrative services agreement, so that includes our staff in our Trillium Behavioral Health Division, uh, as well as several staff in our Public Health Division who are paid directly through that agreement. And uh, as Alicia and I were talking after your meeting last week, uh, I think it's really important that you all are tracking on this relationship. It's a huge, uh, important stakeholder for the county and certainly for Health and Human Services. Um, I asked Louise Colberg, our administrative services manager to look at our revenue from last fiscal year and um, more than $28 million of revenue came into Health and Human Services um, through our relationship with Trillium, both direct billings, our administrative services contract, and the wrap payments that we're able to access um, because uh, we have a Medicaid contract with them. So it's an important relationship, absolutely. Uh, so are there specific Additional questions. Uh, I know there's been concern amongst providers, and my sense is it's been worry. Um, so I haven't heard of any specific changes that people are concerned about. Um, but if you have, I would love to talk about those. So uh, thank you for the update. And in, I would suggest that's probably the case. And uh, there are folks who have I've had conversations with who are, in a sense, wondering, what does this all mean? Uh, so I'm going to use a, a quick example. I think this is maybe where this is going, and, but I, I, I would still be interested in Terry coming and having a conversation with the board. I really would. I think, I think that that would make sense. I think we could advertise that. So folks who, who are outside, they're, they're probably going to be having conversations with him anyway. But I think even in the public setting, it'd be, it'd be interesting just so, so that some of the public could be here. So as we know, several years ago, a company called Triad came in and took over McKinsey Atlanta. That was somewhat of a disaster. They left. But since then, uh, community health uh, Healthcare systems, community health systems out of Tennessee. So CHS, the largest privately held uh, hospital organization in the country, then then took over McKinsey Island. I've had a standing quarterly meeting with Maureen Kate and now Chad Campbell since I was mayor, and I still have that today. And what what I have seen there is that you still have a local board. 
guy, Mike Schwartz, who we know is former NFL board, is chair, chairman of the, of, the, of the local board. And what I have found is that CHS clearly allows significant autonomy to McKinsey and Atlanta. So decisions are being made. Now what they do have is they, they have an enormous capital investor to really work with them as they're going through this $85 million in investment that they're, that they're going through right now in McKinsey and Atlanta. But overall, the autonomy and how the hospitals operated, it's been somewhat hands off. Now, and good news from McKinsey and Atlanta is that CHS is going to splinter off. They're going to keep a CHS, they're going to splinter off into a smaller group of 38 hospitals. McKinsey and Lemmett will be part of that. All of a sudden, McKinsey and Lemmett will be one of the flagships of that smaller 38 uh, hospital group where the kind of the parent CHS is going to continue to operate the larger hospitals, which is, by the way, where Maureen is now in Spokane. She's now operating a, a huge network in Spokane, Washington. And so I, I think that that's probably where this is going, but, but I think it's, it's, it's always important just to have information available. And uh, so, you know, you get a call, call from, um, uh, I'm not going to say his name probably, so, but, but, uh, but you get a call from somebody who is highly involved in the, in the healthcare network here. What, what does this mean? Are you getting additional information maybe that I, I don't have? And, and well, right now the answer is no. So that's why I think maybe having the meeting with Terry that makes sense. It's probably going to be, uh, uh, my, my guess is, that economy will remain. I think things will, will continue to be smooth. But Centene is a much larger operation than, than Agate. And the last thing we need is for a parent company to all of a sudden come in and say, you know, we're going to blow up how things are done and, and do something else. And then we're, we're a complex surprise. So I, I don't believe that that's going to happen. But I think at the same time, just for the peace of mind, it would just make sense just to have that dialogue. And so that's kind of where I'm at. But I think the update really, is, it's a nice update. It's clean. It kind of gives us just, it just we're continuing down where we are. And, uh, but still, information is always valuable when, when you have a, a change like this. So that's, that's what I'm thinking right now. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I would agree with Michelle Larkin that I think that it would be hard to have Terry come to the board, and it would be great if we could invite some of the, some of the, not all the folks that, um, you know, I heard from some providers down in Kite Grove that were a little bit worried, and they really felt like, you know, Lane County, you're our voice. We're not sure that we're, you know, equally at the table. And there was a lot more transparency in their mind years ago. So I had someone tell them they're just really worried that you know they want to make sure that they understand um, how things are working. And, and I think that if they don't feel like they have a direct voice and concerns that they have a voice, they want to make sure that we're representing us. So, so. I think anything that we can do to bring you know, additional transparency and communication to this, um, the better, and I think that it would lead to better relationships. That's going on, and, you know, everybody, I think, is probably just a little bit nervous, and the folks I've talked to are nervous about where is it going. And then, um, is Lane County a better place? So, um, those are the things I heard, and I think that, you know, I think that the commissioner I can offer up would possibly go a long ways to help them with that. <laughs> Maybe answering their, their, their concerns. Commissioner, the other piece that would be helpful for me as you talk about this, because I know Terry would be happy to be here, if there are particular things you want in advance in the packet or you want him to be prepared to address, to let me know that too, so we can make sure we get you what you need. Thanks, and, and I, I, uh, I think having Terry a couple of you would be a, a very good idea. And one of the things that I would like to hear Terry talk about is something that uh, we always look at when a large outside company comes in and takes over something that we can hold dear, you know, or, or if they want to build you know, a huge housing project downtown. Um, we want to see what we've done in other communities. You know, um, take a look at, you know, Centene is not small, and this is not the first place that's entered the, uh, entered the uh, 
this market and it's what I do on the call. So what, what's happening is when they've, when they've um, come into partnership with existing, um, existing agencies. Um, I, I personally, I don't know, I don't, I've, not, I've not studied it myself, but I'm very, very interested to see how did some people act in, uh, I don't even know the town, let's say Albuquerque. I'm going to go Albuquerque. But they have a plan in Washington, for instance, so that's pretty uh-huh. close to home. So getting a read on, you know, um, what happened, if we have something that happened three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, how is it now, based on what they said it was going to be like at the time they went in, and how, how did the local providers feel about it three years down the road based on what they said. I, I can tell you that um, there are some things, some things that have happened in the city of Eugene that whoever, the people who were doing them said that it was going to happen a certain way and you know you look at it from, when it comes to, comes to fruition it's not even close to what they said it was going to be. Some of that has been and some of our maybe family housing has been filled down. You know so it's uh, so uh, <laughs> So, you know, I, I think that's a good gauge, and, and I think um, Terry should be able to draw that information and be able to present it to us from somebody. I think, I, I don't know that anybody in the room has any reason to ever have instructed Terry in any way that I said. Oh, and I think he really liked Gonzaga, I mean, that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would echo the request to all the commissioners in terms of information about this. I, I would also probably broaden it to um, this affects the delivery of, of medical and mental health services in the community, and there are existing organizations that represent uh, the psychologists and the medical doctors. I think the Lane County Medical Society and the, and the Lane County Psychological Association, I believe is the title. But, you know, there's organizations of professionals who are independent of, of, of all of us and of each other, and they might have a perspective to uh, give on this that we otherwise would not hear. Clearly, with Lane County having an administrative services agreement to work at Trillium, there is a, quite an interaction between Lane County government and, and Trillium. And uh, so we have to be aware that we are ourselves, or the county as an institution, is affected by this. Now, we don't know how, and so far maybe there's been no effect. But um, uh, I think it would be helpful to, to have that, per, that perspective because those organizations are independent of the health plans and the health insurance industry, and, and they have an independent perspective. So, I love to always being the contrary. I'm not as concerned about having Terry come back in because this answers a lot of my questions. You know, Trillium is basically acting as the CCO for Lane County that we help form under state law, you know, a coordinated care organization. That doesn't change whether they're owned by Agate or under 17. They still have to be a coordinated care organization, which we have a shared governance with. That's why we have three seats on the board. Yeah. None of that changes. You know, so so I, I'm not as concerned about who the parent company that owns Trillium is. They still have to meet the requirements of the coordinated care organization to meet that legislation and, and the intent of how the Affordable Care Act is carried out within the state of Oregon. So that's, you know, you've answered my question. We're not losing our seats on the board. We're maintaining our presence on the, on the committees. Um, you know, our contracts are still good. That Our contracts have, you know, so really whether it's Ag in the background or Centene in the background of Trillium, we're still dealing with a coordinated care organization. Now, if the legislature changes that legislation, I'm, I'm much more interested. In fact, probably what I'm much more interested in is what's coming down the pipe under the Affordable Care Act and changes in reimbursement for services to the states and then how the states are going to be able to make that up and, and whether or not we actually have much more of a risk involved in those changes than we do in who owns Trillium. And that's what I would like to hear a work session about. Because as I understand it, the next biennium budget in the state's going to be greatly impacted by that. 
and I don't mean just a few million dollars deficit we're talking about here. Um, and their ability to continue, you know, we got we gained some great benefits through the Affordable Care Act in their reimbursement for addiction treatment and a few other services that actually saved us a lot of money in our in our uh, our um, 3194 grants and and other you know our CCA funding, our community you know uh, corrections act funding. Because a lot of the organizations that had been, we had to support that treatment, suddenly it became over to the state, and they were reimbursed through the Affordable Care Act, and that money freed up and we bought other services with it. If suddenly that's going to dry up, that has a huge impact on some of those, those community correction services and those diversion programs. I would much more like to see a work session about what's coming in two or three years under the Affordable Care Act than whether or not really is owned by Sentinel or Ag. Personally, I'm, although I do appreciate the concern of providers, change always is a stress factor. And one of the ways to get rid of that stress is with information. So if we have, you know, Terry come and speak to us and helps relieve that stress with information, that's great. But, but frankly, I'm more worried about the ACA. Um, Commissioner Rosevich, I appreciate that, and I think it's really a great place to circle back around in terms of the Board of Health, that we have, we as a department, we as a community, have a huge imperative to deliver on improving health because that's the only way that the cost savings that the ACA is built on will actually uh, be supported over time. And we, we have to get the strategies that are going to produce the outcomes that Commissioner Sorensen was asking about and, and reduce those cost drivers if we're going to be sustainable over time. That's absolutely the So did you get, I, I, I'll reconfirm this on your agenda team request, but uh, did you get? Uh, I think we got five work sessions coming up. <laughs> Actually, I think we got one on tobacco and one, one specifically on chili. And, and maybe we can wrap a little ACA preview into the chili one if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so is there any further questions on that item? So anything else you have for us on, on the chip or, or in general? Those were the three um, objectives we had for today. Um, so if they met your objective, then I think we're finished. We're about that. We're only about 10 minutes over on time. Not too bad. It's a lot to talk about. Well, I appreciate you all coming. And you know, once again, I'll just say, you know, I'll agree with Commissioner Farr that CHIP is one of those things that's really easy for us to talk about. When I go to AOC, it, it stands out amongst a lot of the counties um, when you're talking to them about their coordinated care and, and the various things. They just are not there with their strategic planning and just how it's led to, to completing strategies, not just that we have strategies, we've completed stuff. Yeah, that, that's really important, and I really appreciate the work of all of your staff on that. Thank you, and I have to say, from my side, it's a pleasure to go to my county meetings and be able to talk about the engagement and work of our board um, as commissioners and board of health. Um, you really are uh, head and shoulders above many counties as well at being willing to engage in this work. And so it's a pleasure to walk down that path with you. And your overachievement shows in the number of steps you achieved yesterday. <laughs> 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 I walked to uh, Human Services Commission from here, which was over at Shelter Care. That's how I got my step. Walking, I walked away to the Senate Drive. Although Commissioner Farr drove past me, got blocked away and wanted to know if I needed a ride. got in, too. Uh, so thank you very much. With that, I think we need to jump back in our agenda to commissioners' business and announcements. Any announcements for commissioners? See none, and we'll move on to agenda team request, work session request. And I counted three work session requests that came up in the terms of the meeting. I just want to double check that we have three head nods on each one. One was for the extensions. Uh, so 
with us to continue discussion of their funding and possible levy and other funding mechanisms. And I think I heard three head nods during that meeting, but I just want to look around the table and confirm at least three head nods. I'm seeing those, so that's item one. Item two was the tobacco pipe before tobacco items that were discussed in the, in the chip. And I've seen one, two, three head nods, four, five. I think we got five on each of those. And then the final one was to have um, Terry Copeland from Trillian come in and have a work session about the transition of the same team and maybe a little bit of discussion of the future of the ACA at the same time. Looks like we've got three head nods on that one also. Any other agenda team requests? So, um, based on our discussion earlier this morning, I was interested in uh, having an update on the revolving loan fund and uh, on economic development, but that could include uh, Steve Dignan from Elkhart, who sounds like manages that, to just kind of give us an update of where we are, because uh, uh, frankly, I think this is one of the, the better uses of those dollars that this board has put together. And uh, it sounds like it's being used, and that's very exciting. So maybe just a quick update on that. Thanks, Mark. Sounds like we've got three head nods on that one, too. So that's four, four future agenda items. We have the tailors. See them, and then we'll move on to um, review of assignments. And obviously, we have the four agenda items. Anything else? That was. Um, we just did a good recap there. Uh, there are a number of items under 8B the uh, Oregon State University um, extension discussion, but I think those are all in the court of OSU extension office. Um, um, Patricia Stewart did ask, and as a response to public comments, that we, and I don't know if this was an assignment necessarily or um, but I took it that to, to connect the numbers provided by the gentleman at public comment with Joe, was just Joe, I believe, um, with our human services division statistics. I just missed it for the first hour, which is okay. Okay, so that's going to be discussed in the poverty and homeless in Florida. Okay. So I don't have anything else other than what you covered by the. The chip items, the work sessions on tobacco and uh, petroleum and what did an ACA. And the request for the commission right now to be revolving long term. Great. So we have no need for executive session today. Is there any other business for the board? Seeing none, then we are adjourned. All right.